So welcome everybody to the L6 seminar series. Uh, today we are hosting Professor Yossi Ovel from Sagol School of Neuroscience in Tel Aviv University. Uh, Yossi received his PhD from University of Tübingen and Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics, where he worked on algorithms for echo classification. He then did a postdoc at the uh, Neurobiology Department at the Weizmann Institute with Nachum Lanovsky. And today Yossi is a full professor at the Zoology Department at, at the Tel Aviv University and also the head of the Sagol School of Neuroscience. Uh, Yossi's field of research is neuroecology and his studies focus on how the brain shapes behavior constrained by the environment. He uses miniature technology to record the behavior from bats while simulating their natural environments. So before we start, the usual announcement, uh, we encourage questions during the talk. Feel free to unmute yourself and kindly interrupt with your question when you, whenever you feel the urge to ask a question. If you're too shy, there's also the option to write your question at the chat, and I will do my best to convey your question. And of course, there's going to be time at the end of the talk for, uh, uh, for question as usual. So let's welcome Yossi. Yossi, the stage is all yours. Okay. So uh, thanks, uh, Didi, thanks for the invitation and welcome everybody. I, I want to start by saying uh, happy Delfitel to anybody who celebrates. And, you know, I, I'm in Germany at the moment. It's very hard to see what's going on from here. And, and I hope really that uh, I, I, don't, I don't have good words, but let's just hope that everything uh, gets better soon. So, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, um, one second, why is my presentation not moving? There. Okay, so what uh, my lab tries to do is to study what I call decision-making in the wild. And I know people use decision-making in many different uh, uh, terms or use it differently. So I want to say a few words about what, what do I mean when I say decision-making. So let's take an animal, my favorite animal uh, model, a bat, that is uh, perching in its cave just before exiting, just before emerging to forage. If you think of this animal, it now has to process many different types of information. It has its own sensory information. It has social information, so it can uh, look at what others are doing. It has uh, the ability to use different cognitive processes, which I wrote here in memory, but that's only one example. And of course, there's also predisposition, such as its navigation ability, and there's, there's the environment, of course, and all of these together have to be somehow integrated by the animal in order to execute decisions. So what kind of decisions? Here are some examples. If you think of foraging, the animal has to decide where to forage, when to forage, should it forage at all today? Maybe it's better to stay in today. How to forage? Should I move in a group? Should I move alone? And this, of course, is a recurrent uh, procedure which reoccurs one again and again within the night, in con consecutive nights, within the season, between seasons, and of course, uh, uh, every year again and again. So I'm going to hopefully touch on three of these uh, factors which I um, uh, defined here. And I will start actually with uh, work that we do in the lab and then later on I'll go out to the field. So I will start with uh, sensing and recently uh, we, we were uh, engaged in a project that has to do with measuring distance. How do echolocating bats measure distance? So of course I don't have to explain echolocation. Most bats uh, rely on echolocation, not only every all bats can see. And uh, if you think of echolocation, the bats emit sound, sound uh, returns, is received by the bats, and uh, the bats somehow translate this into distance. So this is the common concept, okay? Now, in order to translate time into distance, you need to know the speed of sound. So we were interested, nobody has ever um, examined how do bats know the speed of sound? Do they learn it? Is it innate? Can, can they adjust it, okay? And you can see here an example. So this is a frequency over time. These are echolocation calls of a bat that is uh, approaching a target. You can see that the calls are changing, the intervals are changing, the bandwidth is changing, everything is changing, the frequency is changing. And you can see that the bats execute this series of uh, uh, changes in a very ordered manner a long distance, okay? So at a certain distance, they will do this. At a certain distance, they will do that. And this is of course very important because they have to prepare themselves to, uh, to landing so, or to catching. So this is a sensory motor uh, process. Uh, the students who, who are in charge of the projects will always be presented the, uh, on the slides. So we decided let's play with the speed of sound. Let's see uh, if bats uh, can adjust to it. Let's see if it's innate or learned. So how do you do this? We simply reared bats in an helium enriched environment, okay? So we 
uh, we add, so of course there's oxygen in the environment, we don't replace oxygen, we just add helium and by this we, uh, we control the speed of sound, we elevate the speed of sound by up to a, a, a 15 to 20 percent. And in the first experiment that I want to uh, describe, we actually reared paps of this species, it's called the Atalef Levanchulai in Hebrew, uh, we reared them in a helium env enriched environment. So from day one, we had two, con two groups, of course, we have a control group in normal air, and then we have the helium enriched group that has never been exposed to the normal, um, you know, the usual uh, speed of sound, okay? They, they have only been exposed to a higher speed of sound. And the task is, of course, very simple. They are perched in this uh, roost over here, and they have to fly something like, uh, you can see down here, something like 1.5 meters, land on the target and uh, receive a, a reward if they do so, okay? So uh, I'll show you a movie from the point of view of the target. You will see the animal flying uh, towards the target and uh, uh, landing on it. This is in a, uh, uh, so you see it's 130 centimeters. The, the animal takes off, it flies, it is landing on the camera literally. So it's very hard to see the moment of landing. And now you will see what happens when we enrich the uh, air with helium it seems like the bat is undershooting, right? So this is what we, what we would expect if, it's, if it has a, a sensory deficit, because when we enrich the uh, air with helium, we increase the speed of sound, right? And therefore the animal perceives the object as being closer than it really is. And therefore we expect to see undershooting, which is exactly what we've seen. However, you have to remember that when we change the density of air, which we do when we uh, enrich it with helium, we also change the animal's ability to fly. So it was not clear to us if what we're observing, what you've just observed, is a deficit in sensing or a deficit in movement. In order to overcome this problem, we decided to look at their echolocation. And a few years ago, we've actually observed that just by looking at the echolocation of the bat before takeoff, okay? So what you see here is the interval the interval between two calls in that sequence that I showed you earlier on. And you can see that if the animal is about to fly a, a different distance, so 90 centimeters, 140 centimeters, 190 centimeters, it will change its interval accordingly. So this is a kind of a window into the animal's perception, right? We can uh, measure its echolocation interval before takeoff, so, right? So not, no motor deficit. And according to this, determine the animal's mm -hmm. perception. Okay, so what we found, I'm doing the top data, and basically we found that there was no difference between the two groups of pups, okay? So we had pups that were reared in air. We had pups that were reared in what we call heliox, a helium enriched environment. We measure both of them in air. They seem to be doing the same. This is the interval, the same interval that I described earlier. We measure both of them in a helium enriched environment. They both decrease uh, their, their interval, suggesting that they perceive the object is closer, right? This is what we expect, right? Because if the speed of sound is faster, then they should be perceiving the object as closer if they cannot, if they're not correcting. And we see the same exact behavior. You can see here the individual pups of the two groups. It seems like the uh, speed of sound is innately encoded in these pups from the day they are born. So from their first flight, they already know something about uh, the speed of sound. No difference between the two groups. This is the final conclusion. If we look at their echolocation, the intervals along the, the flight, so this is along the flight, okay, you can see here distance to target. Again, you see no difference between the two groups. These are air pups, two pups in air, two pups in, that were reared in helium. You can see the um, heliox uh, experiments in, in green and the air experiments in blue. And what you can see in all cases, again, no difference between the two groups, but in all cases, you can see that the pups immediately start with shorter intervals, right? So compare this blue, this is what they do in normal air, to this green, right? So they have a misperception of the target all the way. They immediately start with the perception of the target as being closer, and they uh, do this during the entire uh, approach. They're constantly undershooting the distance of uh, uh, this, their estimation, in their estimation of the distance of the target. Okay, so again, this uh, uh, confirms the result that I showed you earlier, but now you can see that it's during the entire flight and not only in the beginning. Now, this uh, um, deficit, the sensory deficit, might have a real um, um, impact on motor, on the motor sequence, because as I said earlier, the, the sensory motor sequence is extremely coupled, and what happens in Heliox is that the bats basically move everything um, backwards in time. So they start off immediately with a, a, a misperception of the distance and they start their approach earlier and therefore also land, uh, land before uh, their, um, the, before the target. Now, 
next thing that we did is to look at adults. So, okay, it seems that the speed of sound is uh, innately encoded, but is it fixed or is it flexible? Can bats adjust their uh, speed of sound reference? Why should they do so? So uh, you might uh, not know this, but the speed of sound is actually not constant. It changes uh, with different environmental parameters, uh, with temperature being the most important uh, parameter. So the speed of sound can change by at least up to 7%. I would say, you know, this is an underestimate, maybe it could be even up to 10% uh, within the lifetime of an individual. So for example, these Tadarida Bozirensis bats in Mexico, they fly within minutes. They fly from a uh, ground altitude to 3000 meters, temperature goes down dramatically and the speed of sound it goes down accordingly. If you think of bats in Israel flying in midwinter or in midsummer in the Arava, for example, the temperature can, can change, can be up to 30, even 40 degrees sometimes in an extreme case, and, um, and the speed of sound will change accordingly. Therefore, we ran the same uh, exact experiment. I'm going to do it very, very briefly because you already uh, understood how the experiment worked, uh, and we found no adjustment of the speed of sound. So reference, okay? So you can see here bats that, once again, we are measuring this uh, interval on the y-axis, okay, these are two different parameters. This is the interval and this is the duration, but you see the same, exact same phenomena in both of them. You can see that when the animal is flying to 130 centimeters, this is the interval it is using, this is in air. And if we now induce a, a heliox environment, we change the speed of sound, in this case by a very high percentage, 27%, we can see a drop in the interval, okay? So the bat now misperceives the distance, it uh, estimates the distance as, as closer. And in this case, we could we actually try to quantify it. This is why we um, use the 27%, a very high unnatural uh, Heliox um, percentage. And, and this is because we said, okay, if, if the misperception is of 27% from 130 centimeters, this should bring the bat to an estimate of around 90 centimeters in air. And indeed, if we you look at the, at the behavior of the bat at 90 centimeters, you see that it is uh, indifferent uh, or indistinguishable from their behavior in 130 uh, centimeters with helium. Okay, so I'll repeat this again. Maybe I, I did a little, bit, a little bit too fast, but when uh, the bats are flying to 130 centimeters uh, with an underestimate of 27% uh, due to helium, you can see that they're using the same echolocation parameters, suggesting that they are perceiving the distance as being at 90 centimeters, which is exactly what we would expect if there is no compensation at all. Okay, so basically the speed of sound reference seems to be fixed and we've done these experiments over, over many, many days and the bats don't show any change, any improvement, so it really seems to be uh, fixed. So to summarize, the speed of sound reference seems to be innate and fixed in adults. Uh, and this actually brings me to some kind of uh, almost philosophical uh, thought, which is that bats probably actually never um, translate so as I wrote here, bats actually measure time and not distance. They never translate in their brains time into distance when using echolocation. Okay, so why do I say this? If you think of, of the experiment that we did here, we actually, the, the only thing that if you compare this to this, 130 centimeters in air, 130 centimeters in helium, the only thing that changes in these uh, two cases is time, right? The distance did not change. The time changes and the bats respond accordingly. So, so it seems to be that the bat's brain is actually encoding time and never translate this into a uh, distance. Of course, it, it behaves uh, as if it is responding to a uh, distance. So this was uh, the first story I wanted to tell you about. As it had to do with uh, sensory uh, perception. If there are questions, uh, I can take them right now. And if not, I'll move to talk about uh, what I call uh, predispositions. And in this case, it's the animal capacity to navigate, which is of course uh, critical when, when making um, foraging decisions. Now, before I tell you about the story that, uh, uh, about the, the study, sorry, that we, uh, uh, that we performed, I need to say something about the method. So bats are small. Um, most bat species weigh less than uh, 30 grams, and uh, therefore they're very difficult to track outdoors, which is what we want to do if we want to study their navigation. And therefore we have to develop our own uh, miniature sensors, which is what we've been doing in the past 10, year, 10 years. Uh, you can see here one of the smallest sensors uh, in the world, which includes a GPS device. Okay, so you can see here a bat, actually I'll come back to this bat later on, that navigates more than, one, than 200 kilometers every night. Uh, we also record um, audio on board the bats. Uh, we can connect the camera if it's a bigger bat. We can record physiological signals. So you can see here ECG. We've also recorded EEG to look at sleep uh, in bats. And all of these um, 
sensors can be connected to this uh, main uh, sensor. I'll just say a word about audio recordings. I'm not going to talk about audio today, but this is one of the main things that we do. And, and I think it's extremely um, beneficial to study bats because of their use of audio to sense their environment. Okay, so uh, you can see here spectrograms recorded on board the bat. We have frequency over time. Okay, and these are the signals emitted by the bat that is carrying the microphone on its back. So now I have a, a window into the animal's behavior, even when it is flying, you know, 2,000 uh, meters above the ground uh, level, which we've seen already bats doing, or far above the sea, for example, which we've seen bats do. So now I can, can look at them, can study them, monitor them wherever they are. Here you can see an example where we look at the interaction between a bat and it's called specific, right? So this is a, a call, an echolocation signal emitted by another bat, a nearby bat, what we call a conspecific. And indeed we use this in order to study, for example, jamming avoidance to see, to show that uh, bats do not respond to other bats by uh, performing a jamming avoidance behavior. They do not change their frequencies as some people have uh, suggested. We can look at, uh, at, at attacks, at foraging. Okay, so here you can see an example of an attack, just like I've showed you uh, I've shown you earlier and on, you can see the intervals decreasing, the signals becoming shorter, suggesting that this bat is now attacking something. And in many cases, I know what is being attacked. Well, not in many, in some cases, sorry, I should say. I know what is being attacked. In this case, we study the bat foraging on uh, frogs in Panama, and we can also record the frog. So these are recordings of the frog uh, vocalizations, which are actually used by the bat. So this bat uses uh, what we call passive passively uh, uh, hearing uh, versus you know, active echolocation. So it, uh, it listens, it eavesdrops on the frog and uh, 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 localizes it and, uh, and attacks it. And in this case, I know that the attack was successful because I also record the chewing right after the attack. So for example, today we have a whole study looking at the, at the chewing, at the foraging success via chewing right, as a proxy and comparing this to the movement of the animal and to its sensing right before the uh, attack. But let's go back to movement because this is what I'm going to focus on in the next uh, 10 minutes. And essentially what we were studying in this st study, what we were examining is whether uh, bats can use what is known as cognitive uh, map-based navigation, okay? So I, I'm sure I don't have to um, describe the cognitive map theory to this uh, audience. I'll just say that it is under huge debate, especially in the wild, whether wild animals can use it. And the, the main reason for this, I think, is that it's hard to perform a, a controlled experiment that shows this in the wild, while in the laboratory, maybe this has been shown, but in very, very small scale. So why is it so difficult to, to, do, to show this in wild animals? Uh, the answer is that the, the, hallmark, the, the hallmark, the proof for a cognitive map uh, uh, navigation is considered to be a novel shortcut. So a novel shortcut is defined as a movement in a new trajectory, rather straight line between a familiar locations, okay? So if we look at this bat, for example, which we tracked in the wild for uh, almost 100 nights, you can see that it has several preferred locations, point A, point B, point C, and you can see that it's moving towards them. The cave is over here, of course, and you can see that at some point it, prefer it performs what we could consider a shortcut. So this is a long distance travel. It's uh, something like 50 ki 15 kilometers between two familiar sites in a rather straight line. However, we cannot be sure if it is novel, right? So the part of the criterion is a novel shortcut uh, and is, is the novelty criterion for, for showing a uh, use of a cognitive map like uh, navigation. And we cannot uh, um, be sure that this is novel because we don't know the history of the animal, right? This animal can be 40 years old when I catch it in the field. I have no way uh, to really age it. Well, maybe now with methylations, I'll be able to do that, but I still don't have the history of the animal. I don't know what it did yesterday or what it did 10 years ago. In order to overcome this problem, we came uh, up with the following idea. We uh, established our own colony in Tel Aviv University, uh, an open colony. So the bats roost in our colony, but they are free to fly out and come back and do whatever they want, okay? So you can see here three nights, each night in a different color of one individual. And you can see that uh, its behavior, I would call it natural behavior, because already on the second night, it finds another colony in the uh, Eretz Israel Museum near Tel Aviv University. It's if you want, it comes back and it's our colony. So it's very typical to our bats. They interact with other bats, come back, they leave us sometimes. But the advantage of this system is that it now allows us to track the same animals from birth to adult, adulthood continuously, knowing their, their full history. Okay? So in the movie that I will play right now, you will see the bat, uh, uh, the same individual for something like uh, 
something like a 60, if I remember correctly, color coded for blue to red. And you can see the full behavior of the animal. So when the animal arrives here for the first time, we know it has never been nearby, okay? This is several kilometers from the, from the, from the colony and we know it has never been uh, in this area before. And now I can really address this question of, uh, of novelty. Okay, maybe I'll skip this slide. This slide just shows how they increase their, uh, their, their home range over time, which is what you've seen in the movie. I want to mention that these are fruit bats, and this is important because it means that they return to the same fruit trees, to the same locations again and again. Okay, you can see 1,000 uh, trees that we mapped in the area of Tel Aviv University. Uh, by the way, we are now looking at planning. Do they plan where they go? But uh, uh, as I said, this is very important because if you think of a bat that, uh, for example, search for insects, it will never return to the same location night after night. Maybe not never, never is a bit too strong, but it will rarely do so. And even if it does so, I can't know if it is really, or I, I can't hypothesize, I'm not sure if, it's, if it is aiming to do so, or maybe it just did so randomly, okay? So this is the advantage of working with fruit bats when, um, when asking this specific uh, uh, question. And, um, um, to cut the long story short or shortcut, I will give you the final answer. Uh, the bats perform shortcuts, okay? So you can see here one example. Uh, you can see in pink what the animal did before uh, performing the shortcut. And in blue, you can see a straight line navigation, re relatively short in this case, so less than one kilometer, uh, straight from its last feeding site to the colony in this case in a trajectory that has never been taken before. How do I know that it's never been taken before? Look at these uh, white trajectories. This is everything the animal did before. This is the full history of the animal. And you can see that this movement is completely uh, novel. Uh, if we look at, uh, we looked at uh, something like, uh, if I remember correctly, 23 pups over um, between three and, uh, and five months, each of them. And all together, we uh, detected uh, more than 100 shortcuts. You can see here a few examples, in all of these blue lines, uh, which means that the animals form shortcuts uh, on average every uh, eight to nine days. So what does it mean? This seems to be maybe a, a, a low rate of shortcuts. Yes, most of the time they are not performing shortcuts. If you think of yourself navigating through a new environment, most of the time you will follow a, what we call route-based uh, navigation, right? You will return a long trajectory that you've already used. You will use beaconing, you will look at the uh, very salient landmarks and will use them. But if necessary, you can probably also sometimes use shortcuts, which is exactly what we see that the bats are doing. If you wonder which sensory system they are using in order to do so, uh, we claim that the answer is, uh, is vision. Uh, so these bats are highly visual. They use echolocation, but these are very lo long range navigation. navigation and it is, probably, it is quite unlikely that they're using uh, echolocation uh, for such navigation. We also know that they're not echolocating all of the time because we record sound uh, on board them. And so how, how could they actually use vision to map the region? Uh, what we did, and I'm, I'm giving you really just a, a taste of the entire study, we did a lot of controls here, but what we did is to fly a drone to the exact locations and the exact heights where the bats uh, started their shortcuts. And we found that the bats mostly ascend before performing a shortcut, uh, and you can see that once they ascend, the whole, this is a 300 the panoramic 360 degree uh, image, and you can see that the entire horizon opens, the or urban horizon. And, and in this urban horizon, there are many landmarks, okay? So uh, uh, Azrieli uh, Towers uh, and U Towers, and, uh, and I haven't been in Israel in a while, I'm, I, I'm starting to forget these landmarks, but uh, you can see a lot of landmarks uh, which the bats could, of course, we don't know if these are the landmarks that they use, but they could use them for navigation. We actually ran a study with humans and showed that the people who are familiar with this region can point to the direction of the a, a target, in this case, the colony, based on these landmarks with an accuracy that is quite similar to the one uh, of uh, the bats. Um, I also want to say that there is, we found the correlation. So this suggests how they could determine the azimuth, but do they also know something about the distance, right? If it's a real map, they need to know something about the distance. And we show that there is a correlation between the takeoff speed of the animal and the distance of uh, the shortcut. So the longer the shortcut, Right, and I, I haven't said this, but we saw shortcuts up to 20 kilometers long. Those are the longest that we've seen. So the longer the shortcut, the faster the bat will take off already at the beginning uh, of the flight, suggesting that it knows something about distance as well as uh, uh, about azimuth. Right? I didn't show here uh, uh, the slide, but if we, I would look, if I would show you the distribution of angles of 
angles relative to target, you would see that it is very narrow around the target, suggest, suggesting that the animal knows the direction to the target. And if we compare this to many different random models of the animal moving according to its own movement, according to correlated walks, according to a completely random movement, um, nothing predicts such a, a narrow distribution of angles around the, the target. Yes. Uh, so maybe another option to solve this problem is to do beaconing, right? So if you know yeah, so, if it's near a landmark and you don't need to have a cognitive map for this, right? Uh, okay, this is, would be one of the, uh, for some reason I can't go backwards. What, this would be one of the um, alternative explanations. Uh, okay, so beaconing for those of who, you, who, don't, uh, who don't know would be Nivut Masua, would be flying straight to, um, straight to the target by perceiving it somehow, it could be its odor even, from a, from a distance. Um, I would say that even if you fly to a tree, which is near, just near a beaconing, I would still call this beaconing. I would still not call this cognitive map. So let's say there's a tree right near Azraeli and you see Azraeli all the way, Azraeli towers, and you fly to it. Uh, I would say this is still beaconing. However, uh, if you remember this image, I showed you that there are, each bat flies to hundreds of, hundreds of trees. And uh, we've, we've observed shortcuts to dozens of these trees. Yeah, maybe even, I, I, I don't remember the number, but we haven't quantified it, but dozens of the trees, okay? So thinking that there is a beacon, and, and you, know, you know, we are Israeli, I don't have to explain this to you sometimes to people abroad, I have to explain, but we know how trees in the urban environment in Israel looks like, right? Uh, they're usually in some backyard, hidden behind the, the wall of the building, some, you know, Melias, Derech, is Derech tree. They're, they're, they're not huge salient in any way. So you, had to, you have to assume, if you think that everything can be done by beaconing, you have to assume, you have to assume that, uh, I, guess, I guess we will continue. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, tell me if you think otherwise, but I, I will just continue in the meanwhile. So uh, you have to assume that there is a beacon uh, near each of these, uh, uh, near each of these uh, targets, right? So, which is something extremely unlikely. Uh, wh one of the suggestions is, of course, order beaconing. This is a criticism we get a lot uh, from, uh, uh, from the viewers. We've done a few controls to show that they're not using order. Maybe I'll mention one. We showed that there is no correlation with the direction of the wind. You expect that if they're using order uh, when they're flying uh, uh, upwind, they will be more accurate than when flying downwind, right? When the odor is coming towards you, there's no correlation whatsoever with direction of the wind. We've, we've uh, performed a few other controls. And I would say also, you know, to think that each of these trees has a distinguishable odor, you know, these are 60% of them are ficus trees, 30% uh, of them are, are, are ficus kadosh or, or from the same species, uh, ficus religiosus. To think that they have distinct odors, you know, would be, so amazing for me that, you know, if somebody shows this, I will, uh, I will eat my hat, let's say this. Um, yeah, so I hope this uh, answers your question. Maybe, maybe I'll say another, you know, another option that is often uh, uh, suggested is uh, path integration. Uh, so, you know, p uh, animals are known, some animals are known to be able to perform, uh, sometimes it's called dead reckoning or path integration. So they uh, kind of accumulate the vector of their movement and based on this, they remember a home vector towards a certain location where they, they have been. So first of all, we've performed translocation experiment. I, I don't have a slide I can show it later if you want, where we take the animal and we move it to a location where it has never been, and we can see that it, it returns from there. So this is something you don't expect uh, with path integration, um, right? Because with path integration, if the animal did not move uh, physically and if it did not see the world, if it, not, if, it, if it could not sense it, it would not have the, the ability to uh, accumulate this uh, a vectoric movement, um, and path integration is, is renowned for its accumulation of error. So this is known for all animals that have been studied. If you move longer uh, and if you make more turns, you expect a hard, higher um, error rate uh, or less accuracy. And we've shown again that there is no correlation between the accuracy of the path of the, path of the, of the shortcut. So if you look at the, um, at the accuracy, the straightness of the shortcut, uh, there is no correlation between it and between how much the animal moved or how much it uh, turned, okay? So again, contradicting uh, uh, the, the expectation from path integration. So the last thing that I want to show, show sorry, related to the story is, um, of course, it would be probably one of the questions you would ask me, um, from what age can bats perform um, shortcuts? Is it innate disability? Do they have to acquire it? 
And what you can see here is the, the rate of shortcuts along, uh, ah, sorry, I see that I, my X label disappeared, but this is days uh, outside. Okay, so day zero means the first night this bat was ever out in the world. And you can see that there's no, really no pattern. Okay, I would say that this is really flat uh, with noise, of course. Uh, suggesting that they can do so, they can perform shortcuts from their first night outside. It's not the first day in their life, okay? They already might have, a, a, you know, their whole uh, hippocampal system working as, is, as has been shown for uh, rodents on day 16, if I remember correctly, Didi probably remembers better than me, uh, but uh, they can do so from their first night outside. If you look at the distance of the shortcuts over time, of course, these are increasing, okay? So when they have mapped a small part of the area, they can only perform short shortcuts. And when they have performed, uh, when they have mapped, sorry, a larger part of the area, then they can perform a, a continuously a, a, a longer and longer uh, shortcuts over time. Uh, I'll just say that today, so in this experiment, we actually deprived the, the pups from their mother guidance. Usually uh, in, the, in the real world, the pups are carried out by their mothers, as you can see here, for uh, something like two months before they start flying alone. We deprived them from this because we didn't want anybody to teach them, okay? So we only let them be with their mothers inside and then we let them fly out alone when they are at the right age. But in nature, this is what's going on. And now we are studying the role of the mothers, whether the, the mothers in uh, nature play some sort of a, a guidance role. And, and I'll tell you the, the, the bottom line is we think they do, and although I don't have time to talk about it. Um, but it seems that they are guiding them to trees which would uh, allow them to start the, their uh, navigation. I just want to show uh, how we study this. So by placing accelerometers on the mother and on the pup, okay, so you can see the mother here in uh, green, the pup in uh, uh, this uh, reddish orange, whatever, and this is the z-axis acceleration, so actually the wing beat, the, the movement of the animal up and down while it's flying, and you can see how it is uh, 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 synchronized in antiphase, right, because the pup is uh, carried out upside, upside down, uh, but you can see easily how we can easily distinguish between uh, when the pup is on the mother and when the pup is not on the mother, okay? And it seems that the mothers carry the pups, as I said, and then they drop them off on these trees, and then later on the pups know how to navigate to these trees alone, which suggests, if we are right, that the pups actually learn this uh, navigation path uh, without any active movement towards it, only by being carried uh, to it on board their uh, mothers. So this was a, a navigation. And in the last part of the talk, in the last part of my talk, see I still have something like 10, 10 minutes. I wanna talk about what you see here is memory. It's not really memory, it's more, it's what I call cognition, cognitive processes, decision-making. I wanna talk a little bit about the actual decision process or what we know about it. So I'm going to take you now to another bat species in Mexico, this is a, a this is a nectarivorous bat. It's known as Leptonycteris. You see it uh, drinks uh, nectar from these flowers. Uh, these are flowers of the Cardon and Saguaro cacti, which flower in northern Sonoa Desert uh, in spring. And the females uh, arrive, they migrate to this area in uh, around May in order to uh, enjoy, when they are pregnant, in order to enjoy this uh, huge um, resource of food, okay? So these are this is sugar water. Uh, basically. And when they do so, they arrive at fields, the, the mothers, uh, in a second you'll see, they fly very far to a field with hundreds of cacti and thousands of flowers. Each cactus can have several flower, uh, flowers. And now they face a problem that is very similar to this bee problem, okay? Imagine you arrive at a, at a field with a lot of resources, uh, but also a lot of competition, okay? And now you have to decide how to sample this resource. You don't know anything about uh, the actual availability of the resource, okay? So you see the flowers, but you don't know which one of them has nectar, which one was depleted a second ago, uh, perhaps. Uh, and you could randomly find the best uh, uh, flower, perhaps, and stay near it. You could map several flowers and move between them. These are all possible strategies. One of the uh, suggested strategies is known as a, a trap line, okay? You can see it up here. And this is the idea that it comes from, a, a, you know, the hunting, laying traps along a line, and then um, checking them in an ordered, systematically in an ordered manner. So going along a trap line, okay? This is one of the suggestions. It has been suggested that bees do this, and perhaps also a hummingbird. 
Okay, so I've shown you the, the bat and the location. I'll just give you a little bit more information. This is the cave where we work. There, there's something like 100,000 100, females arriving here every in May. Uh, they, they leave their pups. What you see here is the ceiling of the cave with uh, uh, something like 100,000 pups on the ceiling clustered together, keeping the warmth while the mothers fly out to forage, okay? So each of these colors is a different mother. And I showed you this earlier on, look at this mother that flies uh, almost uh, more than 100 kilometers, right? The straight line is, to, is 95 kilometers, more than 100 kilometers one way, and then more than 100 kilometers back um, to reach this field of cacti. And in this field, she has the problem which I have just described. Now, because these animals feed on this one resource during this period, we could quantify the resource. If you think of these footpaths that I showed you earlier on, there's so many different types of trees. So even if I map the trees to know what is available at every moment is almost impossible, right? So this is why it was very difficult to, uh, to think of a model. But in this case, we can fly a drone above the field where the bat was foraging. We can map the positions of all of the cacti, right? So in green, you see the positions of all of the cacti. And if we come early in the morning, we can actually, so this is the, the picture that we get and you can see the flowers, we can actually map the flowers, okay? So we can see this cactus had four flowers, and this one had four, and this one had two, and this one had one, and this one had zero, and so and so. And I should say that the flowers open in the evening and fall off in the, in the morning. So they are specifically there for, uh, for the bats. The, 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 this is a co-evolution story. The cacti want to be pollinated by the bats. Um, um, so, because they depend, of course, on the bats for uh, reproduction. Uh, so, this is the available resource for one specific night, and tomorrow it might change completely. Tomorrow, this cactus could have many flowers, and this could, cactus could have uh, none. Okay, by the way, I, I now remember that I have a, a bottle of tequila here because these same uh, uh, bats also pollinate the agava um, flowers, which uh, are uh, how we get tequila, of course. So, without these bats, we don't have tequila. Uh, here you can see that the bats uh, return to the same field night after night. These are different nights. And I show you here, this is the same image as I've shown you before, just these are the cacti and I color code the number of uh, flowers. And I want to argue again uh, that there, it's very hard. It's not as if there's a region in the field where you have high quality cacti, okay? There's one good cactus here and one good cactus here and one good cactus here, and this will change tomorrow. So actually the bats really have to come in and sample the field uh, every night before they uh, make decisions or during their uh, decision process, okay? So let's look at the behavior of one individual bat uh, in one field. You'll see the cacti and you'll see it moving between the cacti. And if you pay attention, you will see that it is returning to the same cacti again and again and again. So it's not staying in, at one cactus, but it's also not moving randomly. It, it, it's returning to the same cacti again and again, sometimes dozens of times during the night. Okay, so this uh, behavior that I show you here in total is something like uh, three to five hours, uh, but of course it's, uh, it's uh, speeded up so that you can, uh, you can see it. And if I uh, summarize this behavior in one slide, you can see all cacti in the field and you can see uh, color coded are the cacti that were visited by the bats according to the number of visits. And you can see uh, what we call a core of cacti. Okay, so all of these cacti that are circled in red are cacti that were visited more than five times, which we call the core. You can see that some of them were visited up to, as I said, dozens of, uh, of times. So we tried to model this behavior and we, we tried to, to, to look for a very simple model and we came up with something that is very similar to reinforcement uh, learning in which uh, each cactus has a score. Okay, so the score, so each bat remembers a certain set of cacti. The number that we chose was 10 for different reasons, doesn't really impact the model but let's say the bat remembers the positions and qualities of 10 cacti. The score of each cactus depends on its quality, W, and uh, its uh, distance, T, so the time to fly there. Okay, so the, the longer the time, the lower its score. And this, of course, is dynamic. It changes all the time based on your position. And the weight of the cactus uh, is, uh, is a function of how much nectar I drank there. Okay, so I, I, the weight at the, at, the, at the moment, T, depends of the, on the cactus's uh, weight at the, at, the, at the previous uh, moment, and it is updated, very similar to reinforcement learning, according to how much nectar I drank, uh, normalized by some kind of average drinking, and there is some kind of a learning rate uh, parameter. Okay, and we actually fit the learning rate, so I should not use the word fit because we did not fit it. We actually found the learning rate parameter 
by uh, running a, an evolutionary algorithm. So we ran a simulation, an agent-based model, uh, and uh, we uh, ran an evolutionary algorithm in order to find the, the best uh, alpha. And when you uh, let simulated bats behave according to this behavior, so, so I, I didn't say how they sample, so they have a score for 10 cacti, right? So uh, uh, for, for a specific bat, it has a, 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 corp, uh, a score per cactus and per time, and it will then just sample from this distribution of uh, scores. So cacti, basically cacti that have higher scores, it will have uh, higher chances to be visited. And if you now let simulated bats behave uh, according to this, uh, this rule, you see that they divide the uh, field into cores, okay? Similar to what our bats did. Uh, so what you see here is the actual positions of the cacti were taken from, from the wild. Um, each color is a different bat. A, a cactus that has a larger circle means that it was visited more times, okay? You can see the numbers here. And you can see that the bats form what we call cores, okay? So the yellow core is over here. Uh, and, and note that the core is not necessarily geographical, which is also something within the wild. So the cores can be mixed geographically. They are distinguished uh, cactus wise, right? So each individual has its own cacti. If a cactus has two colors, it means that it is shared, but on average, you can see that there's a share of 1.5 bats per cactus. And in reality, we estimated a very similar uh, range. So it seems to be a very efficient um, strategy to divide the field into these cores uh, efficiently. Of course, we assume that all bats are, are equal, let's say, their aggressiveness or something like this in this model. If we compare the behavior of the bats to the model, so we looked at four different parameters, actually five, I'll show you in a second another one. So this is the accumulated number of cacti visited a long time, uh, and this is the proportion of visits for the number one cactus, the number two cactus, etc. And uh, the number of, uh, uh, sorry, the time difference between visits and the distance between visits in all of these parameters that we measured, uh, you can see that our bats in black behave very similarly to the model in red. Okay, the blue model is another model that we used in which we introduced aggression where the bats actually fight with each other because some people have hypothesis that this is important, uh, but we show that there is no difference between the red and the blue model. Okay, but the main point is that our model seems to be uh, performing similar behavior in this criteria at least to the one uh, of the bats. And what I like best perhaps about the model is that if you also look at the exploration to exploit, sorry, the exploitation to exploration ratio, Okay, so exploitation means returning to the same cactus again, a known cactus, and exploration means visiting a new cactus. And if you look at the ratio, the proportion that the bats do this and over time, right, you can see that uh, in both cases, it is increasing uh, similarly. Okay, so a model in red, a real bat in, in, in black, which is also something I would expect from the bats. So as I said, when they arrive at the field and nothing is known, you first have to start with a lot of exploration and slowly, slowly you have to move to exploitation once you have uh, mapped beneficial cacti, uh, perhaps using this reinforcement learning like uh, uh, approach that we suggest. So those are the three stories that I wanted to tell you about, to touch on. I will not summarize everything. Instead, I will say a word about our future plan. So in the future, uh, in the near future, we would like to look at, uh, at uh, uh, interactions between these two factors, uh, different factors. So how do bats weigh them together? And of course, we would like to manipulate these uh, uh, different uh, factors. And the problem with all of the studies that I showed you it is that it's very difficult to monitor these bats over a very long period. We managed to do it over months, but not over years. And it's very difficult to manipulate the animals in the wild, whether it is because there's a lot of resources like in Israel and different resources, or whether you know, in Mexico, there's a very short season where they arrive and, and, and the, the distances are huge. So the plan, and this is actually, uh, we recently received the NLC grant for doing this, the plan is to take uh, over a, an island that is uh, relatively uh, large, so it allows real scale behavior, but not too large, so that we can um, monitor the movement of the animals on this island without losing them, hopefully. So in Israel, eventually we lose the animals, we can track them for five months, but then they start disappearing. Sometimes they come back, but we don't have continuous tracking. So here we expect to have continuous tracking of the animals, and we also have to ho hope, sorry, to be able to manipulate them. So by using automatic feeders that we can control in the wild, 
Uh, we can uh, play with the decision-making uh, strategy that I have just uh, suggested, for example. Uh, we can change the, the beneficiality of a cactus to a certain individual. We can uh, convey information to part of the colony and say how this information is transferred between the colonies. So hopefully we can do a lot of these uh, uh, manipulations, uh, which you know most of us uh, do when we work in the lab, but are very difficult to do uh, in the field. So uh, yeah, that is it. Uh, thank you very much, especially in these difficult uh, times. I have to thank uh, a lot of students that uh, actually contributed to this uh, data collection and, and a few collaborators and funding agencies. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yossi. And uh, it's fascinating and exciting times ahead for the island plans. Uh, we still have time for questions, so please, please feel free to ask questions now. Uh, excuse me, uh, the, the small uh, chip that you attach to the bats, it uh, saves the memory on board? Yeah, that is uh, the, the most uh, painful uh, part, uh, the most uh, difficult dilemma. Uh, yeah, indeed, it is a logger. That was a decision we had to make when we started. We knew, we, we realized that transmitting the data will be too expensive. Uh, we, energetically. We now have a transmitter version which would work with big bats. One of the reasons why we're going to an island, I, I can say already the island is uh, Mauritius, at least that's what, what we're hoping, is because they have a, a fruit bat there that weighs 600 grams. So it's a giant, it's a monster for a bat. Uh, and this uh, bat will be able to carry much more, something like 30, maybe 40 grams. And then maybe we can think of transmitting uh, some of the data some of the time. For example, audio can never be transmitted, okay? It's huge uh, data with a very high sampling rate. But uh, let's say acceleration, position uh, are things that are, are types of data that can be transmitted. How long can you record? Depends on what you record. If you record the position only, and it depends on the battery, of course, or the size. So, you know, the, let's say the smallest device weighing something like uh, two and a half, three grams with the smallest battery, you want to do only GPS, let's say, and you want to do it once every, I don't know, 10 minutes, so very, very low rate, you would get uh, days of recording. If you want to record audio continuously, 200 kilohertz, which is what we do, uh, it will give you one night of recording. So it really depends on the scenario. You can control all of this. That's, that, that's all controllable. Thank you. <clears throat> More questions? Yes, so um, you recorded beautifully the behavior and you said that you were recording also from the brain. Well, where's yeah. the brain? Yeah, good question. How do you get the brain into the loop, especially outdoors? So the problem uh, uh, with recordings outdoors is that it's uh, probably, uh, probably will remain unethical to record animals uh, uh, invasively outdoors. Right, because if you lose the animal, you, never, you can never really be sure that you will not lose the animal. And if you lose it, it's, it's highly unethical. Uh, so Nahum, for example, I'm sure you've heard him uh, recently, is building these huge tunnels where he can try to mimic outdoors, indoors. Uh, we've tried different approaches. One of them is a non-invasive approach of recording uh, um, you know, subcutaneously, uh, EEG. Um, so this is uh, something we've done for characterizing sleep. I don't have any interesting results to show uh, yet. Um, another approach that we've been using is to uh, record the uh, uh, bats as they are flying in uh, captivity, uh, but mostly we're interested in, uh, in echolocation in this case. Uh, again, I'm talking about physiology, uh, but in the context of uh, echolocation, not so much spatial navigation, which is what uh, Nahum is, uh, is doing. And another third approach that we've been using um, is to do different types of, uh, uh, of MRI recordings. So, uh, for example, one approach would be to record the uh, bat. We've done it. We're still analyzing uh, before and after a certain experiment, right? People have shown that uh, such uh, uh, sometimes plasticity can be can show up uh, in uh, MRI recordings, uh, imaging. Um, so this is something we've been doing uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm still. We, we are now doing histology in parallel in order to to be uh, convinced that what we see in the MRI is uh, reflecting some sort of uh, uh, plasticity. Uh, and perhaps I will say that there is another option that we're always uh, looking at, and that is fMRI, of course, which is very difficult with these animals because they're moving and we don't really like to head fix them. 
Um, but this is something we have not uh, given up and, and are thinking of, mostly actually in social context. So I haven't looked, I haven't shown anything about their social uh, behavior, but there's a lot of uh, uh, social communication, vocal communication going on. Uh, we've shown statistically that you can uh, distinguish between vocalizations emitted in different contexts. Uh, I think I talked about this uh, in Hebrew University in the past. And now we really want to show how the brain responds to these different contexts and of course the behavior. And there we are thinking of, uh, of going into the magnet. Okay, thanks. More questions? Okay, so I think we'll conclude here. Uh, I hope all our friends in Tel Aviv are safe and sound, and uh, uh, hopefully everybody's going to join us uh, next week. <laughs> and uh, thank you again, Yossi, and bye-bye. Uh, thank you and take care. Bye-bye.